Hey everybody, welcome back to another fantastic edition of the His and Her Money Show, where we make it our business to help you take dominion over your money and your life. Thank you for tuning in because you could be listening and watching a whole lot of other things, but you're here with us. And for that, we want to tell you thank you. We're excited about today's episode because we have a special guest that we have admired for a very long time. And this is our first time getting the chance to talk to him, to get some wisdom from him to each and every one of you. So we're going to be talking with New York Times best-selling author, John A. Cup. He's got a brand new book all about goals because we need this practice, this discipline as a part of our life. If we're going to do something great, if we are going to take dominion over our money and our life, we're going to need we're going to need a target to aim at. And John's going to help us understand this a little bit more. Trust me when I tell you this information you're about to receive is information that you need. So get your pen and paper ready or get your notes app open on your device and get ready to accumulate all of these jewels and nuggets that John is about to drop on each and every one of us. So stay tuned. Let me go get John and let's get this conversation started. Hey, John, welcome to the His and Her Money Show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Man, so excited to have you here. We've been, uh, my wife and I, fans of your work for a very, very, very long time. But there may be a couple of people listening to the show right now who are hearing the name John Acuff for the first time. So for them, would you mind saying hello and then just kind of letting them know a little bit about what you are all about? Totally. Yeah. Um, I live outside of Nashville, Tennessee with two teenage daughters and my wife, Jenny. We've been married for 22 years. And the first 15 years of my career, I was in corporate marketing. So majored in advertising. I was writing ad campaigns for, um, for companies like Home Depot and Bose and Staples. And then I started a blog that um, got a little bit of traction. And from there, I kind of started doing the side hustle. So I was full-time day job, side hustle. And really fell in love with the idea of communicating ideas to people on the side of my traditional job. And eventually that grew into my full-time job. So for the last 10 years, I've had my own company and I do two things all year. I write books and then I go to companies and teams and colleges and speak about the books. So that's kind of my world in a nutshell. And they're mostly books about goals in one form or another. True. I think, I don't know if it's your most famous one or not. I know the metrics of it, but probably one of the ones that rocked me, my world personally was quitter and just the journey that you took people on, um, I think was responsible and helpful, right? Cause a lot of times there's a lot of information out there about how to go about transitioning. And, uh, sometimes it's a little, uh, one-sided. There's a lot of just... bad information, dude. There's a lot of <laughs> garbage. What are you saying? Correct. You're being nice. There's a lot of garbage. <laughs> like, yeah. There's a lot of like jump off the cliff and grow wings on your way down. That's not how <laughs> gravity ever works, dude. That's not how, that's how people wreck their lives in the pursuit of a dream. So yeah, Absolutely. I, people told me they were mad about the first chapter of that book. Cause the first chapter is don't quit your day job. And yep. some people were looking for me to be like, screw your screw the man go for it like just don't have a plan finances don't matter like chase your dream and the universe will give you ribbons like whatever and i was like nah that's not how you win long term no it was very responsible and anybody who's kind of in that tension of like what john was describing with his own story he had the nine to five side hustle and it grew and grew and became the main thing and he outlines it in detail it's a fantastic read Here's what no one wants to hear about that process. And then I'm sure we'll jump into a million different places. You can't half do your day job and think you'll all do your weekend hustle job. Like you are practicing all week. If you're practicing laziness and quiet quitting and half doing things and being disrespectful, that's how you're going to play on the weekend. Like if you want to be amazing at your dream job, it's not fun information. I know, but like, Turn your day job, work as hard as you can at your day job so that you're in motion and you're in practice to also then work as hard as you can on your side hustle. That's a bit like that took me years to learn. If you can learn it in a podcast, you're so far ahead of everybody else. Like the more I poured into my day job, the more I saw dividends in my dream job because I was on, I was honoring it. I was being deliberate. I was, I wasn't disrespectful. I wasn't, you know, oh, I hate, I wish I didn't have to do this. The trick there is, speaking of money, you become your own venture capitalist. You look at it as I'm funding my dream with my effort. So like you become your own angel investor. 
So it, like, yeah, go find investors, certainly if that's your path. But in the meantime, be your own investment fund, like with your day job, have the day job, fund the dream job. And then you'll like the day job even better because you can start to see, oh, these two things are connected. They're not divorced. If you can marry those two things and be one person all week versus, you know, one person Monday through Friday and a different person on the weekends, man, it's so much better. Why do you believe, because you're very thoughtful in your writing and in your approach to your research, why is it um, a tough task to dream big and match it with work ethic? Because sometimes the we can dream big, but our work ethic doesn't match. Or sometimes we dream too small and therefore we never actually reach the totality of the potential that's within us. What What's wrong with our dream gazer? Is there, how do we recalibrate it properly? Totally. So that was one of the things that was really fun about this new book that just came out. All it takes is a goal because it gave me a chance to reframe the goal ladder that most people use. So most people, what happens to them, imagine like a ladder, a 12 foot tall ladder with two rungs. There's a very top rung and there's a very bottom rung and there's just space in between. So what they do is they go, I want to make a million dollars or I want to release an album. I want to write a book. I want to lose 50 pounds, whatever. That's the very top rung. And then the very, very bottom rung just says day one and they have no rungs in between. If I gave you that ladder and was like, hey, you got to get to the top, you couldn't. Like 12 feet is two feet higher than a basketball rim. Like what could you do? Like jump and try to grab it. What I like to do is go, what if I gave you a ladder that had a rung every six inches? Like could you climb to the top of that ladder probably pretty easily? And people go, yeah, of course. Well, that's what you have to do to translate your goals. So you have the big dream. You have to have the big dream. And here's what I've learned. Nobody changes just because. Nobody just wakes up one day and goes, I'm going to have persistence. I'm going to get my money in order. I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to have grit. I'm going to have willpower. That's never how it goes. What happens is people catch a desire. Like they catch a small thing that they're like, ooh, what if that could be true of my life? Like, could I go back to college? Could I retire? Could I write a book? They get this small desire. And then the desire teaches you all the other stuff. Because once you have a real desire, it starts to swallow up your time in a good way. So back to my story, I start blogging on the side of my day job. I didn't decide to watch less television, get up earlier because I'm a hard worker. I have very little natural discipline in my life. I decided to get up earlier because the blog was so fun to write. I wanted to do it more often. I wanted to throw more time at it. So that inspired me to get up. And so having that desire, you've got to have the big long range goal, but then you have to figure out a way to make it into small things you can do on a daily path, like small little things. So that's the big key there. Your second point was we dream too small. That's just fear. That's a hundred percent fear. And it could be fear you inherited. Like I, you know, sometimes it's from your family of origin, like nobody in your, in your family thought you could dream or success was demonized. People said, must be nice. Like if somebody had a nice house, they'd say, oh, must be nice. They must cheat. They must, you know, maybe they're drug dealers. Like there was a negative framework for success. So of course, anytime you think about success, you go, well, success is selfish. I can't really do that. So there's a million different ways that you can kind of get stuck in that loop. I, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I'm going to tell it myself. And I, I know you've done some extraordinary things as well. So I'm warning if it ever happened to you, we made a goal to because this is our 10th year doing his and her money. And at a certain point, we wanted it to become the thing that we did full time. We made it a goal. We started to work the plan. John, we got there, right? Um, we paid off all of our debt. House is paid off. We had a year's worth of savings. Our business was making money enough to sustain us that we didn't need another income. I was still scared, John. I'm a husband a father of three, I'm like, but what if it does? They're, all the metrics said that it's going to work, John, but what if it doesn't? What do you do when you make the goal, chase the goal, put in the work for the goal, get to that precipice, and you're still scared to leap? Well, you're going to be scared. Like, that's the thing. So one is you expect it. I think there, I think one of the hard parts about fear is that we think we shouldn't feel it or we think it shouldn't be there. So we feel like a failure when it shows up. So one, expect it. See it as like, oh, I must be doing something challenging. So part of the reason we feel that way is, again, back to garbage motivational advice. People say you should be fearless. You should be fearless. I don't agree with that at all because every time I do something at a different level, there's new fears. So the first time I spoke to 10 people, like I'd never given a speech before, 10 people, I had 10 person size fear. 
the, the, but I worked on it. I got over it. Then I spoke to a hundred people. I had a hundred person size fear and I had to work on it and get over it. Then a thousand person size, 10,000 person size. So for me, one of the soundtracks I use and soundtracks is just a phrase I use for like a repetitive thought is fear gets a, a voice, not a vote. Like it gets a voice. Like I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to see it there, but it doesn't get to tell me what I do or what I don't do. It doesn't get to vote on my life. And so I think you have to one, it's going to, there's going to be fear there. And then you have to say, okay, what are some things I can do that are tactical, that are practical, that are number based? Like, that's why I love data. Like I, I'm not a numbers guy. I'm a writer. So like I wasn't a math guy growing up, but what I've learned over time is that data kills denial, which prevents disaster. Data kills denial, which prevents disaster. So what often happens is that you start keeping some data. You go, okay, me and my wife are going to lean into this podcast. We're going to keep track of all the hours we're putting into it. Or we're going to keep track of the downloads. We're going to keep track of the growth. And then when fear goes, hey, you're, you're really not into this. This isn't going to work. You go, it's so weird you say that, but because look at all the data I have that says the opposite. Like you're just an emotion. I've got, I got numbers. I got facts. And so like for me, an example of that would be imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome can't really say anything to me right now about writing books because I have a whole shelf of them. Like this was my ninth book. I just turned in the 10th, you know, this morning. So if imposter syndrome tries to tell me, you're not a writer, you're not a writer. I go, oh, this is so awkward because I got all these books that have my name in my photo, like on them. Like I think I might be a writer. The only way I've ever found to crush imposter syndrome is with results. And so you expect the fear and then you drown it in results. Like you just go like, Hey, I don't know what to tell you. I'm going to keep writing. I'm going to keep doing my thing. I'm going to keep leaning into the podcast, but you expect it there. And then it's also like, it's a healthy thing for you to go. I'm a dad. I'm a husband. Like I want to be responsible in this. How do I do this in a responsible way? I'm about long-term sustained success. I don't want it to be it's a flash in the pan. I do one book. I have one hit, whatever. I want to be able to retire in this dream. Like I don't want to just have it be something that pops off one time when I'm 38 or 27 or 42. Like I want this to continue to go. And so that changes, you know, the questions I ask about, am I being responsible? Am I doing the right thing? And that's just a different approach to it. So the word goal means different things to different people. What is a goal according to John A. Cuff? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I come back to the first word I like to define is potential because they often go together. You know, people like say, I think I want to do a goal because I feel like I have some potential. So I define potential as the gap between your vision and your reality. So you have a vision of how you thought life would be or how it could be. And then you look at your reality and they feel a long way apart. And most people go, wow, there's the gap is so huge. I'm disappointed. And I say, no, that's just potential. Look at all the potential you have. And so what a goal helps you do is close that gap where you get to bring your reality closer to your vision until one day they overlap and you look up and go, yeah, I'm doing it. This podcast thing, which was a hobby is no longer just a hobby. Like this is my thing. Like the reason restaurants frame their first dollar bill of sale isn't because of the money it's because of what it represented. Their vision of opening a restaurant just met their reality of here's a real dollar bill from food people paid us for. And that's amazing. And so that, that to me is what a goal is. It's a chance to close the gap between your vision and your reality. And why is it so imperative if we have a dream that we want to chase or it's sitting in our heart or it's been just festering in our mind, we can't shake the thought of it. Why is it important to start with the goal in order to make this thought, this burden, a reality for us down the line? Well, a goal is a vehicle. A goal is a vehicle to get you to that dream. So if you said to me, you know, John, I want to go to L.A. I live in Chicago. I want to go to L.A. I wouldn't say, like, are you going to walk? Like, I would say, you know, the best way to get there, it's O'Hare or maybe Midway. You're going to want to take an airline. Like, you would have a vehicle to get there. That's what a goal is. So if you say... I've got this dream. I've always wanted to write a book. I've always wanted to pay off my college debt. I've always wanted to have a million dollars in retirement, whatever. A goal is the vehicle that's going to actually get you there. A goal makes it real. A goal gives you steps. A goal gives you an outline. A goal gives you things you can check off to know you're headed in the right direction. Dreams are awesome. They're, they're amazing. You need a dream. 
but a dream um, isn't enough. A dream is a great start, but it isn't enough. You need a vehicle to get to get you there. And in my opinion, a goal is an amazing vehicle. I think it's the best vehicle. And then I just know finishing a goal is one of the best feelings in the entire world. Like you live in Chicago, like people don't cry out of sadness when they cross the finish line of the Chicago marathon. Like they weep for joy. They did a really difficult goal and they did it. Like it's one of the best feelings in the world. People who are chasing goals that they feel called to chase are some of the happiest, kindest, most generous people in the world. They can't help but want to help other people do the same thing too. And so that's, you know, for me, just you could call that even a side benefit. Like you're happier, you're healthier, your time feels different. You end up being more generous. Goals always start with self, but usually end in service. Because if you experience something good, you want other people to experience it too. It's kind of like a movie is more fun when you're with somebody because you you turn and laugh at th with them. Like if you ever go to a movie by yourself, you'll catch yourself looking next to an empty seat and going, oh, that's right, nobody's here. But when you go to a movie with somebody, like you're shared in that experience. That's what a good goal does too. It creates community change too. So it starts individually, but it's something you internalize and then you externalize it and it can change families. It can change neighborhoods. It can change, you know, whole countries. Like that's the power of a goal. What do you see people get wrong frequently in their attempts to create goals for themselves? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a number of things. One is they um, never introduce their goal to their calendar. So, you know, a dream that's not introduced to your calendar is just a wish. It's just a fantasy. And so one thing I'll see is I'll have somebody go, John, I have 20 goals. And I'll go, well, how much, how much time are they going to cost? Like for you to do them with a degree of excellence, how much time? And we'll work through an exercise and they'll come up with a number. And then I'll go, okay, cool. That's your number. How much time in your week right now do you have available? And they'll go, I don't know. And then like, we'll do a time exercise. And often they have 40 hours of goals they want to do. And they have two hours of free time in a week. And their, their dream is completely divorced from the reality of their calendar. So that's one thing that people do. Another thing is um, they don't like small steps, so they overreach and then end up quitting. So in the book, I talk about there's a comfort zone. We all know that zone. We talk about it all the time. When you're stuck, there's no action. But on the other end of the spectrum is what I call a chaos zone, where you try everything. So what happens is people hear a podcast, they get inspired by a book, whatever, and they go, I'm going to you know, do a budget. I'm going to lose 10 pounds. I'm going to do yoga. I'm going to be a better dad. I'm going to sign up for the Chicago Marathon all in this weekend. And that's chaos. And they swing from one end of the spectrum, comfort, all the way to chaos. And they never accomplish anything. And it's overwhelming. And that's why we have the phrase yo-yo diet in this country. People yo-yo back and forth between no action and too many actions. And they never figure out, okay, the middle is the potential zone. That's where I'm living out of my potential, where it's the right amount of actions, the right amount of goals. And so sometimes it's they have too many goals. Um, and then sometimes it's they they're so afraid that they don't even start. They're so overwhelmed by the fear of it that they don't even take a few different steps. Um, and and they they get stuck before they re even leave the front door. You mentioned that when uh, somebody approached you about goals and, and one of the things that you said was how much time can you give to it with a degree of excellence? Talk about what the role of doing things and excellence has played for you as you have pursued your goals, because sometimes, like I've even heard recently the phrase, which has some, some truth to it, but I would love your thoughts on it. Done is better than perfect. So when you're chasing your, your goals and your dreams and your desires, talk about excellence. Yeah. So I would say excellence is different than perfectionism too. I wrote a book about perfectionism called Finish because it's something I struggle with. Another great read. Um, oh, thanks. I appreciate that. So yeah, there's a difference between, you know, between those two things. Perfectionism is a myth. Like perfectionism is just um, fear wearing a tuxedo. It's one of these weird things that we'll say we struggle with as if it's a good thing. We'll go, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, but real perfectionism cripples you. You're never finished. Even if you finished, you're not happy. You can only see the things that failed. Like you could do a hundred things right, but the two things you messed up, you'll go, yeah, the whole thing was a waste. Um, for me, what it looks like to do things with excellence is one thing is paying attention, paying attention to the process and then figuring out ways to improve it the next time I do it. So sometimes it's as simple as taking notes on something and going, oh, okay, I can be more excellent if I do it differently this way. So I'll give you an example from my world. So I'm a public speaker. I speak about 50 times a year at companies and I wanted to like, I, I, I caught myself saying a broken soundtrack out loud and the soundtrack was 
my career will stall because I'm not a celebrity. And what I mean by that is if you won the Super Bowl, you can come in, do an event at, a, at like a corporation and get paid 10 times what I get paid. And it's just a Q&A. And I was like, oh, man, I'm not a celebrity. So I'm kind of stalled out. But then I started to think about that. And I was like, that's not helpful for me to say, because what I'm telling myself is just give up. Don't try. So I was like, okay, well, I need to get around the celebrity limit, the celebrity ceiling, if you will. So the ways to do that are going to be in my content quality, my delivery, and my customer service. Like I'm going to excel at those three things. And I'm going to put a lot of excellence into those. Like I'm going to like, I'm going to have way better delivery than somebody who won the Super Bowl. And I should. Like I suck at throwing touchdowns in the Super Bowl. They're not amazing at public speaking. They haven't done that. Like that's, I should be amazing at that. And so I'm like, okay, let me work on that. Let me do it with excellence. The customer service, here's a specific example. Instead of giving general gifts to people after. So I go speak somewhere and there's three people that I worked with and I give them a gift. Now I'm asking them questions about the things they really love while I'm on site, while I'm doing the pre-call. And so for instance, a guy told me, he grew up and he loved Eric Davis from the Cincinnati Reds. He was from the Cincinnati area. And we talked about that. I was kind of the same age as him. So after the event, I sent him a, an Eric Davis rookie card. Like, and that blew his mind. That blew his mind. And a year later, my friend was speaking at that same event. That guy puts on was like, dude, I'm with this guy. He said, you gave him a Cincinnati Reds, like Eric Davis rookie card. Like that's excellence. Like, and it took me a while to figure that out versus going, Every time I speak, I send everybody a copy of my book and it's just a blanket experience. The dude who gets the Eric Davis rookie card, man, has a different experience with me as a leader, has a different experience with me as somebody who cares about customer service. So that's what I mean by doing, doing it with excellence. It's constantly going, how could I do this a little bit better? What does this look like? How do I you know, live with excellence in this? How do I raise my standard of performance for this? Not perfection because perfection never really starts. Perfection always says I'll get in motion as soon as I have all the information, but we don't live in an all information world. We have it for a hundred years. You'll never have all the info. You always have enough. And then you, and then you figure it out along the way. So that's the difference for me between excellence and perfection. You've mentioned a few times the process of getting better along the way. You said it took me a little while to figure it out. Sometimes when you're on this journey of a goal that you are pursuing, if you, if it takes a little longer than you anticipated. If it, you don't check all the boxes right away, motivation could wane and um, you, you fall out the fight. So what is your advice for maintaining motivation, giving grace to yourself as you pursue these goals of yours? Well, no, again, just like you're going to have fear, motivation is going to leave you on the side of the highway as soon as it can. Like motivation is the flightiest thing in the world. We did a study to see when people quit goals in this 30 day test. And the greatest drop off we saw was day two, day two, because on day one, it's a dream on day two, it's work. And when work shows up, motivation often leaves. So you have to maintain motivation. Motivation is a practice. It's not an experience. It's not like you go, I found my why today and for the next year, I'll be motivated. That's not how it works at all. So a simple tactical thing that I encourage people to do is what I call a motivation portfolio. And a motivation portfolio is when you deliberately sit down and you come up with five, 10, 20 things, forms of motivation that will keep you going along the way. Because some days the first five won't even matter. Like you might go, I'm a parent. So like showing my kids that they can chase their dreams. That's my motivation. That's great. Some days that'll help. Some days you'll be like, you know what? I don't even care. My kids aren't really even watching whatever. It's useless. And you'll need something else and go, oh, today the song got me there. Today, the note card that I wrote the truth on got me there. Today, a conversation with a friend who's my great, like my hype man. I got a hype man who's always like, you can do it. I talked to him. Like today, it was, a, it was a men's group that I'm in. You need 10 to 20 things that'll keep you motivated the whole time or you'll give up on it. So I expect motivation to wane. Again, that's not failure. The middle of every goal is boring. Something I've been saying to people lately is excellence is boring, dude. Excellence is boring, but we're taught it's going to be exhilarating and exciting. So then when we go, man, I got to do all this like paperwork, like there's a lot like podcasts. People say all the time, you should do a podcast, podcasts are, you should do a pod, they're easy. And they say it like it's a button. 
is not a button, dude. There's a million things that you have to do. And there's, you get rejected. You ask people to be on the show and you get rejected. Like there's a lot of parts of podcasting that don't feel amazing, but there are those little excellent things you have to do along the way. And so you have to keep doing them. And so for me, I really make an effort to stay motivated, not to get motivated, to stay motivated. Anybody can get motivated. That's, that's like a long weekend. Staying motivated can last a month, six months, a year, because I'm working on staying motivated. Your book is called All It Takes is a Goal, and you've been helping us realize how it's connected to us achieving the things and dreams that's in our hearts to, uh, to accomplish in our life. And you're also a husband. If, if we have these things in our hearts and we want to pursue them, can you talk to us about the, the way that you incorporate your spouse into the mix, into the conversation, into the planning, into the walking, the journey towards these goals and these dreams of ours? Totally. Like the two most important decisions you'll make in life are who you worship and who you wed, like bottom line. Um, and so if you're in a marriage, the, it ha you have to have your arms linked. And so one of the best things I ever learned about dreaming together as a married couple was from a guy named John Woodall, um, who lives in Atlanta. And he said, in every marriage, there's two people. There's a how person and a wow person. So the wow person is like, we're going to do this. We're going to do a podcast. We're going to save our money. We're going to pay off that, whatever. And the how person goes, well, how will we do that? How is that going to happen? How are the steps? How? And often when the wow person shares their dream with the how person and the how person asks questions, they feel attacked. They feel like, why are you ru ruining this dream for me? And the how person is just using their strength. So the solution that John Woodall says is, if you're a wow person, tell your spouse, hey, I'm not about to quit my job. I'm not about to do something crazy. Like, cause often you have often there's some decision in the past where like you went all in on like flipping Jordans and it didn't work, whatever. So you say, I just want to talk. I just want to brainstorm. Can we have a brainstorming conversation? And then what the how person does is for two weeks, they go, wow, that's cool. Like, yeah, we could figure that out. Cause by the end of the two weeks, that wow person will have already forgotten the thing they told you they wanted to do. Like, but if at the end of the two weeks, that wow person is still invested then the help spouse goes, okay, let's get down to details. Like, okay, how could we do that? What would that look like? So for Jenny and I, I'm the wow person. She's the how person. And so we we're deliberate about that. Um, there's a, there's a lot of conversations where we'll, I'll say, Hey, I just want to kind of dream about this idea. Like I want to kind of talk through this idea. Um, and so for me, that makes it really fun because then she gets to bring her strengths and I get to bring mine and they're not in conflict. How much internal work did you have to do there? Because I'm I'm identifying with you. I'm like, I'm super wow. And it does feel like when you, you, you in your mind, you have this perfect, flawless, it's gonna guarantee to work idea. And then here come Miss or Mr. How asking all the questions. And you do, you feel like, don't you see it? Don't you get it? Yeah. Well, so here's, so I've done a, we've done a ton of work. I mean, we've gone to counseling. I like, I think marriage counseling is fantastic. I think individual counseling is great group counseling, whatever. I'm a big counseling guy, but I think one of the things that helped me was not holding her to my excitement level. If I'm at a hundred percent, I don't hold her to meet that same excitement level. Cause it's often my dream. I've thought about it for three weeks or three months and I expect her in three minutes to have the same excitement. Like that's crazy. If you think about it, like yes. that's insane. And right. so I feel bad, John. Thank you. Yeah. I let her be her version of excitement and her version of processing it. Um, and I'll, you know, sometimes, so, but I, I mean, we're 22 years in and so I keep learning things, but I'd say at the beginning of our marriage, when she would ask me questions like that, I would feel attacked and I'd be, it'd be a grumpy week of me being like, she doesn't know what she's talking about. And then eventually I would come back and be like, Hey, that was a good idea. Now it's like a grumpy hour. Like where she goes, Hey, I, I don't think we should do this. Here's why I'm like, what? And then like an hour later, I'm like, Hey, Hey, you, you were right. Like that's, that's a good idea. Let's, you know, so like, I always joke that one of my goals in marriage is to shorten the distance between when she tells me something that's true and when I believe it's true, that it's not, it doesn't take me a long process. I'm able to go, Oh no. Like, and then the other thing is I try to, I try to understand where she's coming from. Um, um, like, okay, she wants the best for me. That's her goal. She's not here to ruin the goals. Like she wants the best, like I want the best for her. And then the other thing it dude is like doing it at the right time. 
So like if we're in the middle of a road trip and our kids have been challenging, like let's not have the goal conversation in that moment. That's the wrong time, dude. Like you're the car's already spicy. You don't need to do it. Like, or if like it's the end of the night and she's exhausted and I go, Hey, here's this cool idea. Like, she wants to go to bed. Like, so part of it is being like, can we go get coffee? Can we go like, Hey, tomorrow I'd love to talk about this. Like, can you put that in your head? And like, I'd love to get your ideas on it. So some of it is just like knowing the best way to communicate, you know? Good stuff. Thank you for sharing. And before we we wrap things up, I, I think one of the big things that stands out in your approach in your new book is that in pursuit of a dream is also in the pursuit of avoiding a life full of regret. Why is the pursuit of dreams, the goals that we put forth to achieve those dreams, a tool, an asset for us to not get to the end of our days with a laundry list of regrets? Well, so what was interesting in um, the research, so I commissioned a research study with this PhD named Mike Peasley. We asked 3,000 people if they feel like they're living up to the potential, and 96% said no. But what really got me was 50% of the people in the study said 50% of themselves was untapped, which is like only opening half your Christmas presents every year. Like imagine you walk down the stairs, there's this big pile of presents, and you only open half. And friends and spouses and family members and maybe even coworkers are like, hey, those other presents are yours too. And you, for whatever reason, you don't open them. Like, would that make for a happy Christmas morning? Of course not. Would that make for a happy career or a happy life? Of course not. That's what regret looks like to me, is when you know that you have more presents to open than you actually opened. And I love that metaphor because sometimes people look at goals as there's broken things I need to fix in my life. Nobody wants to spend time sitting in that. Like, nobody wants to go like, oh, man, it's shame time. That doesn't lead to long-term change. But imagine if you were able to reframe it as I've got way more gifts than I've opened and I, there's more for me to open, regardless of what's happened in my past, regardless of mistakes I've made or things I've experienced going forward, I have gifts to open up. I want to open as many as possible. That's what it looks like to me to not live with regret. How have you um, lived this out? Because you're often um, intertwined within the pages of your books, your own life. How I know everything on your journey from the outside looking in can look like it's been up and to the right, set a goal, put in the work, you had consistency, you checked it off. Um, on this journey that you've gone through with your career, switching careers, being self-employed, starting your own business and charting your own path, what are some of the adversity that came about even though you were chasing goals and dreams and how did you recover? Because I'm sure people are listening and getting ready to take this journey. They're going to go get your new book. All it takes is a goal. We're going to start the journey, but that journey is not going to go smooth. And I want them to have endurance like you have. Well, I mean, I started an ad agency like 13 years ago that failed spectacularly. Like that was a train wreck in every way possible. So that was, that blew up in my face. Um, and and then there's just been moments where I'd get stuck. So like I got stuck between my book finish and soundtracks. I ended up taking like three and a half years in between because I just got afraid of writing. What I found in my life is if I don't write, it gets harder to write. Every day I don't write or every day I don't run or every day I don't exercise, whatever the thing is, they stack on top of themselves and then it's really intimidating to me. So I, you know, I had like with that, I had to go get out of a funk by writing a lot at a coffee shop. And it was like, I wrote 50,000 words for a book that'll never see the light of day just because I had to write my way out of that funk. But that was a three year, you know, kind of stuck period. So I, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I, I think on the outside, maybe it looks like it's always up and to the right. Um, but there's just so much learning there's. And then the other thing is, I really do genuinely believe that when you find something you love, eventually you forget the hard times. Like there's this really gracious amnesia you experience. And I've experienced that. So the other day, a boss of mine, um, he had a speech and he sent me the clip and he was talking about my journey. And he was like, man, when we hired him, we would send him to empty room after empty room to do speeches. Nobody be there. And he was like, and he, we'd put him on TV and he was terrible. And I asked my wife, I was like, Hey, was I terrible? She was like the worst. And I don't remember it that way. Like I was just like, man, I'm on the grind. Like I'm going to do it. Like I like, I don't even, I really don't remember all those empty rooms because I was thrilled to get to go do this thing. Even if there were 10 people there and it was in Effingham, Illinois in the middle of the winter, like I was like, let's go. 
And so I think there's also that sense of like, it doesn't hurt as bad as you think it's going to hurt. Like you have those moments. Like I still have them. Like definitely there's still things where I'm like, man, that's a bummer. I wish that had gone differently. Um, but I just think too, that you develop tools and then like, I liked my forties better than my thirties. And I think I'm going to like my fifties better than my forties. So like up and right for me looks like maybe I can't, I can't control sales. I can't control a bunch of things, but I can control my character. So like I can control if I'm invested in relationships, I can control how I'm treating my kids. Like there's a lot of things I can control. And as I invest in those, then I feel like life just gets sweeter and sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. And so like, I, you know, I'm a big law of the harvest guy. Like you reap what you sow. Like, I think that's one of the principles that governs most of life. And so as I continue to kind of, sow, I I'm just enjoying the harvest of things that I planted 10 years ago that I didn't know where they'd go, but I'm like, man, I know if I don't plant, I won't get the harvest. I, I often can't control what the harvest will look like or when it'll happen, but I definitely know if I don't plant anything, there's, there's no harvest. And so now I'm just like, I'm 47. What do I want to plant? Like, what do we, you know, do we, do we do a live event? Do we do online courses that help people with goals? Like, let's try some stuff. And then you kind of see what happens and you try it with excellence and you do it again and you improve on it. And so it's kind of becomes iterative. That's how I think about it. Great advice. And I want everybody to know a little bit more about what they'll find in the pages of your brand new book. All it takes is a goal. So let everybody know what's in there and where they can go get their copy. Yeah. So if today you heard anything in here, we're like, man, I do have more potential. Like what you'll find is a tactical, practical way to tap into that. Um, I write books for, uh, I, I write books for three reasons. One, I find content I'm personally connected to. So I um, went back to college to tour it with my daughter and my wife said, wasn't college amazing. I said, no, it was a train wreck. Like I, it was, I wasted all my potential there. So I felt this overwhelming sense of what do I do with that? And I knew, okay, those are four years that I can't change, but I can change the next 40. What can I have no potential? That's the first thing I look for with a book. Second thing is, do people need it? Do, are there other people that feel that way? So we did the study, 3,000 people, 96% of them said, they, they want to tap into their potential. And the third thing is I look for a spot in the marketplace. Can I fit in somewhere on a shelf? And a lot of the books about potential were very high level. It was very, just believe in yourself, just have hopes, just have dreams, like just have a vision. And I wanted something I could do on a Tuesday. I wanted something, if I'm a busy stay-at-home mom, if I'm a working dad, a working mom, whatever, I wanted stuff I could actually do that was tactical and practical. And so that's what the book is. It's a tactical approach to tapping into this thing called your potential. So that's what you'll find inside it. There's a lot of, um, a lot of tools, a lot of fun work. Um, but it's also really humorous. That's I, I love to make people laugh. I think there's a lot of serious, boring business books. Um, and I don't want to read them and I certainly don't want to write them. And so the book is really fun too. Absolutely. You are a fantastic writer. Oh, and you can find it anywhere books are sold. Yeah, anywhere books are sold. I have a podcast called All It Takes is a Goal where I interview people about their goals. Um, and then I read the audio. So if you're an audio person, and congratulations, you are because you're listening to a podcast. I read the audio book and there's 10 bonus stories in it. So it's super fun. Tons of bonus content that's only available in audio. We'll be sure to have everything linked up in the show notes of this episode. John, before we let you go, there might be somebody who is on the fence. Right? They just even throughout the interview, they're fired up like, yeah, I need to. Yeah, John's right. But, 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 but um, help them kind of light a match for themselves, for the potential that is within them so that they don't end that bit only tapping in 50% or, or, or being at the place with the 96% saying, no, nah, they haven't reached any type of potential that's within them at all. Yeah. So I, I would just say you have something you desire. Like people change in one of two ways, an involuntary crisis or a voluntary trick. And what I mean by voluntary trick is they go, Oh, I'm going to, I want this thing. I'm going to figure out how to trick myself out of the comfort zone. Ooh. Okay. I want this thing. I'm going to, I'm going to go chase it. Involuntary crisis is when your life falls apart. So you lose a job and you got to change, you know, something tragic happens. I'd much rather you change your life right now going, I'm going to voluntarily do this. I'm going to find a way to get myself out of the comfort zone. Um, and, and here's the thing I'd say, you have more time than you think. Like the average American watches 34 hours of TV a week, according to Nielsen. Nielsen data, 34 hours of TV a week. Like look at your screen. If you feel like right now, if you're, what's holding you up is like, I'm too busy. Most people aren't too busy. They're too distracted. You have to know 
The reason it's hard to accomplish goals is that the world isn't designed for you to succeed. The world is designed for you to shop. And those are two very different things. So there's, there's whole industries right now that are trying to keep you stuck. So get fired up, get angry about that. Like get some of your time back from things that aren't paying you. If you, if you're worth a hundred dollars an hour and you spent 12 hours on Instagram last week, you, you did $1,200 of work for free. Like you paid Instagram $1,200 last week. Like, are you okay with, I'm not okay with that. Like imagine what you could do with that time like that. And like, it's hard because like goals are hard because Instagram is easy. Goals are hard because Netflix is easy, but you're not going to get the things you want unless you start to work your way out of the comfort zone. Thank you so much, John. We really appreciate you taking time out of your super busy schedule to stop by the his and her money show. I'm very busy. I'm very important. I'm glad you recognize that's what I'm trying to say. Like super important. That's so funny. You absolutely are, but we appreciate all the wisdom that you dropped on us. And we appreciate all the works that you have published to help us accomplish some things in life that we need to get to. The name of the new book again is All It Takes is a Goal. Today's guest, John Acuff. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. There you are, ladies and gentlemen. Another fantastic edition of the His and Her Money Show is in the books. We have the links to John's new book in the show notes of this episode. Go get it. It's very tactical and practical. It will help you on your journey because you have something on the inside of you that needs to come out into this world and you need to no longer sit on it. You need to start to do the work in excellence to get it done. And John's new book is going to help you do just that. That's all we got for this time, guys. It's been great. Until next time. Peace.